great Scott. If my calculations are correct, you are listening to this before your fantasy football drafts have taken place. I have been to the future, and those that followed the advice from the Fantasy Footballer's Ultimate Draft Kit had a spectacular season and with certain many victories. It's almost as if Biff had given each of them a copy of Grey's Sports Almanac. I'd highly recommend heading over to www.ultimatedraftkit.com without any further delay. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. <laughs> that was long. Someone had their, their pre-workout Thursday, right before the show. Thursday, July 16th, 2020. Ooh, Mike, I, little... I only messed around with that pre-workout stuff about <laughs> one time in my life. <laughs> Because uh, there there are ingredients inside of there that were in the um, the time machine from Back to the Future. There was some plutonium inside of that. You like? I didn't feel myself for weeks. So he's, like your skin starts. Oh, it starts being tingling. hot and itchy. Yeah. And, and you look. You feel like you could run a very very long distance. <laughs> yeah. If you've and ever you feel had like if, <laughs> if you don't run that distance, you'll probably explode. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not the best when you look at ingredients. It's like contains. Uh crystal and you're like oh (laughs) thanks walter yeah the periodic tables all jumbled inside of that thing do not take if you have an aversion to science (laughs) to science (laughs) welcome in the fantasy footballers podcast thursday july 16th some news to talk about on the show today we're back in the divisional breakdowns as well the afc west which is uh a division with Patrick Mahomes and other quarterbacks. Right. Well said. That we will talk about. And uh, I'm excited. It's going to be a good show. YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Footballers. If you want to watch the show, you can subscribe. Click the bell. We appreciate it. Be one of those first 200,000, as we oh, said. yeah. Get in. <laughs> Get in while you still can. The window's can. closing. Yeah, we're going to cap it. Did you not know that? We're going to put a cap, a hard the cap. First, the first ever YouTube. So yeah. actually cap. really really disappointed to know we haven't hit it yet because we've we've announced this once before and usually when, when right. we announce anything is just oh, yeah. done the next day <laughs> yeah yeah good point jay twitter at the ff ballers join the foot.com is our fantasy football community you can get into uh local and online leagues that's a part of the join the foot.com uh package over there where you get access to the extra episode the fantasy community the forums bunch of uh really cool stats and uh, proprietary stuff in the season and uh, there's just over 7,500 of you over there at jointhefoot.com supporting the show we appreciate it all right uh, before we get into some big time news we're gonna do a little buy sell buy or sell presented by pristine auction Yeah, Al, Al Borland sent me a little note here uh, reminding me of the pre-workout that I had taken one time. <laughs> that was the uh, whatever the Jacked brand is. Yes, but, jacked. But it's like so intense that they have to use the the number three as one of the letters instead of Well, that's how you know e. it's elite. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. I think it's banned in like 35 states. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and most countries. Yeah. All right, buy or sell. David Montgomery will be a top 20 fantasy running back. Buy Mm -hmm. or sell. His best ball average draft position right now is the running back 23 off the board. Often mentioned in that group of, you know, Lev Bell, David Johnson, Melvin Gordon, some of that kind of crew and where you have to make that decision in your draft. Who do you feel most comfortable with as your a running back two potentially? But what do you think about David Montgomery as a top 20 fantasy running back? I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where I so I, I went and I looked at my rankings once again. I think Brooks putting together these show docs is just scouring my he is currently my running back 
20 on the dot. Oh, but I'm going to sell this and say he's not going to get in because a couple of the running backs behind him, uh, James Conner, Chris Carson, I, you know, I don't know who will stay healthy necessarily, but like those are better backs. Those are backs I would rather put my stock in for fantasy than David Montgomery. And I, I think that the improvements that Chicago has made this year aren't good enough, aren't big enough. I mean, uh, you know, I talked about Nick Foles being one of the more overhyped offseason acquisitions recently uh, that I don't think really moves the needle. And and I remember how desperately this team needed a tight end, not just for the passing game, but for the running game. They were they were rumored for Austin Hooper. They were rumored for Hunter Henry. Uh, you know, they, they were trying to get a big name guy and they went out and spent a bunch of, mu bunch of money on Jimmy Graham who can't block. So I, I just don't see this. I don't see it getting better to the point where he's a top 20 back. It's it's in his range of outcomes, but I don't want to bet on it. I'll I'll buy it just barely. RB 18 in my rankings. Last year, he had 1,074 yards from scrimmage, seven touchdowns in his rookie year. Uh, only averaged four yards per touch. Much like their entire offense, it wasn't very pretty. Uh, but Montgomery will have tons of opportunity. I think he'll stay healthy, and that'll be enough to get him in the top 20. Yeah, it's it's opportunity. I have him right now at RB24, it's, uh, but it it is it is a very tough sell because you have players ahead of him, you know, like Clyde Edwards-Alaire. I have him projected for more points than Montgomery. Montgomery's volume is far more assured than Edwards-Alaire, and, and like Mark Ingram, uh, Devin Singletary, guys I have like just ahead, but the the safety of Montgomery's volume now last year he had that volume and he still was <laughs> not very good he for, was meh meh yeah, yeah he was, was David Montgomery yeah. yeah he was not great for your fantasy team I'm gonna sell him getting into the top 20 but he is his volume <clears throat> is safe and he will be uh, he reminds a, a me decent floor I guess yes, that I that's what I I agree I mean you know when I say that I'm selling him not being a top 20 back and speaking a little bit disparagingly on the Chicago Bears situation uh, that's not to say I, I won't have David Montgomery on my fantasy teams he serves a purpose we you know last episode we went through the Jets and we were talking about Jameson Crowder how he has a floor right and it's pretty much the same as his ceiling. It's just exactly what's going to happen for James. He's going to get a lot of targets. They're all going to be short. He's going to be okay. Cut, you know, have five or six touchdowns. I feel like David Montgomery to me, his, his volume is so safe that I'm willing to take him when he's plugging in that third running back spot. That's, that's what you need someone with volume, but I, I don't see him capitalizing with the, the, you know, some of these players, you hope that you get upside. Maybe he falls into the end zone. I think nine or ten times, I, I just don't I don't believe it's going to happen. Yeah, and that's fair. I mean, last year he did finish as the RB25. Um, really, you remember coming into week one, we thought maybe he'd be the starter from day one. Uh, it pretty much was. Mike it, Davis. Mike Davis it, was week one. <laughs> I know. It, but, but the thing with Montgomery is I do think that there's more ceiling there than meets the eye. We were excited for the Bears running game for a reason and what uh, Nagy had been able to do in years past Obviously not a good season, but I think the truth in that offense is better than one of, what it was last year. And Montgomery in particular has passing game chops. He's a very capable pass catcher. He had uh, several impressive plays down the field, you know, seam routes, things like that. So that, that offers me a little bit more of an upside. But am I going to bank on it? Meh. No. Yeah, it, uh, the thing about Matt Nagy, like we're, we were all very excited. You know, he's, a, he's from the coaching tree of Andy Reid, and we've seen – great success for from offensive people coming from that tree and i think we've ended up with like a like we we thought we were buying a, a legendary performer and we got like a budget ma magician who's up there and thinks like he thinks his tricks are so awesome you know and like oh you've never seen this one before and then then the cards fall out of the pocket you see the rabbit just jumping behind him and because this is what he does, but but then he thinks it's really impressive and keeps going with it. He's like, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me do that trick over. Did you did you see that? Did you see that trick? Yeah. yeah and, then I, you just, and then you just go, yeah, it's it's magnets. Show show me under your wrist. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, he's like, no, 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 right no, 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 no. But have you seen this trick? Uh, and then he just gets the right kicker, and they make this. They go to the Super Bowl. Oh, oh David uh, Montgomery's range of outcomes is running back eighteen to running back twenty four. That's he, <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I don't I, think so. I, what, what do you think is what's his 
Upside, Andy. He's a back in one, like a 10 to 12. Okay. 10 to 12. Hey, 15 plus touches in 12 of 16 weeks is a rookie, and nobody's coming in to threaten that job. If you give him 15 plus touches with pass catching chops and he stays healthy, I think he could make a jump. Yeah, it's just the touchdowns. It's whether or not the offense takes yes. enough of a step forward in order to have him fall into the end zone more. I, I have him with seven yeah. rushing touchdowns. Two receiving touchdowns, so that's that's a that's a good amount over a thousand yards. But he, puts he's him not right at RB twenty. He's not going to do it with seventeen and a half points scored per game as a team. That's not Montgomery is going to be exactly what Jason said, which is you'll be happy when he falls into the end zone. You'll be unhappy the weeks he doesn't, and then I mean, like last year, but the draft price at least is lower. Yes, so. and that's the whole difference. Is that <laughs> last year there was hype? People tried to when, when you got him in your league, it was because you went a little earlier on him because you thought the upside was there, and he disappointed on that. If he finishes exactly where he did last year, and you got him at his price this year, it's like okay, I know what I'm getting now. Brooks, Brooks, when we'll move on, but I want to know where Montgomery went last year. Well, I, I can't remember where that is relative to like Clyde Edwards Alaire this year. I looked back, and it was really consistently a third round pick. Early third round, thir early and third where, where's round pick Clyde in the year. second right now? Uh, yeah, yeah where's the third round third. pick? Clyde's yeah. climbing into the second. There was a lot of excitement around Montgomery last year, so you are definitely feeling those burns. Mm -hmm. uh, that was buy or sell from pristineauction.com. Use the registration code Ballers to get a ten dollar credit. Let's talk some news. News and notes from around the league. See how Brooks already knew the answer to the question beforehand? That was impressive. It was. I tried. The, ju the judge coming through. All right. Um, the deadline has passed for teams to sign franchise-tagged players to long-term deals. But. And someone got one. But somebody got <laughs> one. Dak? No, no, not Dak. No, no, of course. Of course not. We don't need him. Andy Dalton's on the team. Derek Henry. <laughs> Good for you, man. And the, the Titans bag. reached an agreement on a four-year deal, according to Jay Glazer. Four years, $50 million, 25 and a half guaranteed. We were just getting this news before we pressed uh, record, mm -hmm. so we're all processing it. Our initial reaction was, okay, like Derek got paid, but he didn't break the bank. He didn't outpaces Zeke. Zeke's deal's much larger than this one. Similar guaranteed money, but the, the what Zeke's deal's $90 million deal. This is a $50 million contract. We were also discussing Derrick Henry's such the focal point of this offense, even more so than maybe Zeke is in Dallas. So the Titans needed to lock up Derrick Henry. I, think, I don't I've, I don't mind this deal. The deal makes sense for both sides. Whether or, does, not, yeah. whether or not you want to sign a four-year deal on a running back that's going to put him into his age 30 season, that's where I, I worry about it. However, he did come into the league having a couple years behind DeMarco Murray where he wasn't really getting the workload. So maybe you say, you know, less wear and tear. And also big he's boy, big a boy, crazy mammoth of a man who probably can you know go strong in, into his later years but uh that would be the only downside is is you know locking up a running back for four years this late into his career but he's he's awesome and for dynasty um you know I'm you a say dynasty there are three owner sides of, in the deal there's there's the uh titans there's derrick henry and then there's dynasty owners <laughs> yeah and dynasty owners and have to happy. be thrilled because you don't want a guy who you know, if Derrick Henry has a mediocre season this year and then hits free agency, and next year's free agent class for running backs is it's out pretty wild. Yeah. It's 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 incredible, which means not everybody out there is going to get the deal you think they are. Um, this gives security, so I, I I love it for dynasty leagues. But Dak did not reach an agreement. So did uh, I had read some rumors that he passed on a hundred million in guaranteed money. I, yeah, that on was an the extension. rumor. That That's was... tough to do. I don't have the. Uh, I would have to take a <laughs> lot of pre workout to do that. The like Dak. It, it Dak talked about. He's bet on himself his entire life. Is the quote where he he was talking about it. He's gonna make a lot of money this year, and if he like if he is a good quarterback this year, which he's gonna be, because I think that Dak is good. That the the bag will get bigger than it would have been. Had you signed him already? It does feel very low risk compared to 
you know, Derrick Henry goes into this year without a deal. Feels a lot different. Yeah, you can't. You can't. Yeah, do let's that. say both of those guys get injured this year, miss the whole season. They don't even get to play one week. Come the following season, nobody's signing Derrick Henry, and everybody's opening up their purse for. Oh, yeah. maybe I can get Dak now. Yes, without question. So, all right, congrats, Derrick, on the new yes. deal. And dynasty owners of Derrick Henry know that he's going to be part of a really good system, good head coach, good offense. Uh, it's good. Good news for fantasy owners. All right, Texas wide receiver, uh, Texans wide receiver, Kenny Stills was arrested during a protest. He was charged with a felony. He was also charged with uh, multiple misdemeanors. And the Texans organization have come out and said they're aware of it. They're gathering more information. Uh, obviously, any arrest has implications on availability for the season. Kenny Stills has not been a hot topic in terms of like output. You're looking at Brandon Cooks. You're looking at Will Fuller before Kenny Stills in that offense, but he might not be available for some time if there's a suspension involved. Yeah, it, it's it's hard. I don't know the legal process. I mean, it's, this was for protesting, so we'll see if the charges hold up or or not. But you are right that generally when you're facing a felony, there is a, there's usually an NFL suspension behind it. All right, uh, Jason was bringing this up this morning. Um, Philly Voices' Jimmy Kimsky notes, Alshon Jeffrey is, quote, almost certain to start on the pup this year was, in Philadelphia. That fits with the never being drafted in any Scotty Fish League. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that's the expectation all around Philadelphia. This was not an article about his health. It was just an article about whether or not he's he's worth it, uh, if his value and what they, you know, making an argument that they should have cut him last year. Um, but uh, there's no timetable right now for his return, and all the local people in Philly pretty much have an expectation that I've seen for him to land on the pup. So that would be the first six games missed. Uh, so you need to, uh, you know, adjust your expectations accordingly because in later in drafts, and we took him in Scotty Fish because he went crazy late in drafts. But there's this period where you're you're in the 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 mid to late rounds, and his name sounds enticing. Um, because he's Alshon, because you know he's been the number one guy, he's been the touchdown machine with Wentz, um, and 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 you want him, and don't don't do it, don't if you're <laughs> in any kind of redraft league, don't. There's no chance that you should draft Alshon Jeffrey if he ends up not playing the first six weeks. I mean, speaking of betting on yourself, like that Alshon Jeffrey, I don't know if you guys remember it. Yeah, the one year deal, right? He bet on himself going to Philadelphia, and it worked out, and then they won a it, Super Bowl in him his first and his year. Agent, did work the reason you can't cut him jason is like if, if people wanted to last year it would have been uh 20 and a half million dollars of dead cap this That's year a lot would be 26 million dollars in dead cap to move on from i know you can spread no, they, these things out they could but, have they could have cut him before that but then they restructured to where now they oh can't. is that what happened okay yeah. okay so it's pretty pretty crazy yeah he would be somebody that we'll talk about when he returns because of his history with carson wins last year even though he was beat up. I mean, he had a number eight overall finish on in week six, a number two overall finish in week 13, uh, a couple other top 24 finishes. Carson loves throwing him the football, but he's not... Jason's right. You can't just throw him on the bottom of your bench. He's not enough of a guarantee to hold him do for you, six weeks. Do you know how up. old Alshon Jeffrey is? I do. I think it'll Thir surprise you. 30? What do you think, Mike? 30. He is actually 48. <laughs> oh, so I think that's another red flag. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, well, letting all the foot plan know. No, he's. He, I mean, look. I hope I'm that way when I'm 48. No, he is 30, but it feels feels like it. What sucks it's an old is, 30. Is we just we deal with his injuries, but like Andy was pointing out, when he's playing and he's actually healthy, I think he still has enough juice left to be good for his team and good for fantasy football. But we're at this point of, can you ever count on that as a team? Well, and, and the truth is, is if he starts on the pup, let's have that discussion briefly. I mean, they, they brought in Marquise Goodwin. Deshaun Jackson will be there. They have Jalen Rager. Rager. They have two tight ends, and they got Miles Sanders. And I think a white side who was, yeah. Yeah, you know, disappointing rookie pick. last year, but coming back. Yeah, by, to speak to your point, Mike, there were games last year, Alshon had nine receptions for 137 yards, 10 receptions for 76 yards. Yeah. He loves scoring. But at the beginning, you know, six weeks of no Alshon. Not worth drafting. Somebody will be, somebody else, will be a good fantasy wide receiver 
for that team. Who yeah. is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, Boston Scott. <laughs> I mean, it, it's probably Deshaun Jackson. You know what's for, funny is is all the talk on whether it's Jalen Rager, whether it's Deshaun Jackson, and the truth is we actually do know the answer. It's not one of those, like, I'm not sure. The answer is Zach Ertz. Zach Ertz, yeah. Uh, every time that sure. other players have gone down, Zach Ertz. We, we talk about this every year. It's like, oh, like, yeah, Ertz was great, but it took a bunch of injuries around him, and that's why he had the opportunity. If you look at when everybody was healthy, he wasn't really that involved. But every single year, he gets the opportunity, and we know it's going to go to him. So Zach Ertz, to me, if Alshon is on the pup, needs a bump up in your mind because right now he's – you know, he's not even in the conversation with Mark Andrews to a lot of people. It's like it's Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, Mark Andrews, and they don't really care about Ertz. I, I think that could be a mistake with with Alshon's health. And I'll, you, I'll say do you believe that about Goddard then. Not not as much because Goddard, of the goal line opportunities being there. Jeffrey's such a, um, you know, he averages half a touchdown a game or whatever it is. Yeah, Goddard certainly goes up with the touchdowns, but I can't rely on touchdowns when you don't get the passing volume. Ertz gets the passing volume. Mike, Alshon what were you going to say? It's just that Alshon Jeffrey, this is this is just fantasy football strategy. If you have multiple IRs, and depending on what, what platform you're playing on, Alshon Jeffrey may be eligible to go into that IR. So I'm willing to take him with like my last pick, my second to last pick, and stash him on the... IR. I just won't be stashing him on an active bench. All right, and one more bit of news. Washington wide receiver Kelvin Harmon was a rookie last year, six-round pick. Torres ACL, he's miss. He's going to miss the entire 2020 season. Steven Sims, who I think is a very talented, undervalued fantasy wild card type of player, potentially more opportunity in the offense. Trey Quinn's still there. Uh, but you also have uh, – they brought in – uh, Antonio Gandy Golden, right? Yes, uh, yeah, Gandy Golden. Look, hey, he's big, he's strong, he's athletic for his size. And if you go watch tape of him, he played at a very, very small school. But to me, he would be the the most obvious replacement for Kelvin Harmon. Like, I like Stephen Sims too. He's an interesting player, but he's a slot wide receiver, and Trey Quinn is still there. And if you look at Stephen Sims, what he did. You have 29 of his targets came in those final three weeks when Trey Quinn was was no longer playing. So I think Gandy Golden uh, would be opportunity the, would would have the opportunity on the outside, uh, and and he's interesting not not from a like a from a redraft purpose, but I liked him. I liked the the prospect for for dynasty purposes. Uh, it's it's tough to you know put fantasy stock on a team that. You, you, it, I don't really see multiple wide receivers sustaining value behind Terry McLaurin, but he's at least an interesting player and a, a name you should know. Okay. All right. Well, we can uh, get into the divisional breakdown. Before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsor. You know them. Hello Fresh. You can get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with Hello Fresh, America's number one Meal kit, so many different recipes to choose from every single week. Uh, you can break out of the recipe rut, Jason. You want mm. out of the rut. Yeah, sometimes I really do. The monotony of the same meals is lifted by HelloFresh. And I know you love to grill every day, Jay, but that's also unhealthy potentially. So you need to get into the HelloFresh. <laughs> There's something for everyone. You got low calorie, vegetarian, family friendly recipes. And this is, you know, dinner on the table in like 30 minutes. And you can save, this is the cool thing too, you can save up to 28% compared to those grocery store shopping trips. And I know a lot of people are doing the delivery of grocery stuff right now, which is even more expensive. So here you have uh, that built-in savings. Uh, this past year in 2019, HelloFresh donated over 2.5 million meals to charity, which is pretty cool. And this year they're stepping up their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis as well. We've all uh, used HelloFresh for years. Uh, great variety, great product. You can go to HelloFresh.com slash Fantasy80 and use the code Fantasy80 and get this. You get $80 off. Oh, my okay. goodness. Oh, That's what, what, a, a code. what a code. What a mm, code. Mm, HelloFresh.com slash Fantasy80. Use the code Fantasy80 for a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com 
for more details. Let's get divisional. All right, we're one getting... more thing yeah. before I, for, I forgot for to mention this. A part of my love for Antonio Gandy Golden <laughs> is if he look, if he succeeds, mm-hmm. you you're gonna have some Gandy. Have some Gandy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, of course, the most important thing. And honestly, I was very upset that we actually I, spoke about Gandy Golden and, and you I didn't, didn't do it. Yeah. Say it. I had to correct it, Jason. Thank I'm, you. I'm here. I paid for the paid for the crimes. And we <laughs> and we got it out there. Yes, yes. AFC West divisional breakdown, starting with the Kansas City Chiefs, Super Bowl champions, 12-4 and four for two consecutive seasons. Fantasy goldmine of a, of a team. Very impressive top to bottom. Obviously, you know, my job, our job on this show for divisional breakdowns is not to tell you how good the Chiefs are. Uh, that's an it's easy the, job. It's, that's very simple. You just look at every metric everywhere. Dude, that point differential. <laughs> Their point differential is on Yeah, what was it? 143. Second place, second and third, I should say. The Broncos and Raiders, they finished the season tied, but the Broncos had a negative 34 point differential, and the Raiders were negative 106. Well, yeah, they had to play the Chiefs twice. I mean, <laughs> it's not fair to be in that division. They score so many points. Yeah, I, th- I think I read that their average points in losses was 36 and a half so when they lose they Goodness. still scored 36 and a half also you also don't want to try to beat them because right. um when opposing teams led by 10 points on the chiefs during the year <laughs> uh the chiefs were undefeated they were five and oh and then we saw that all through the playoffs right because they were down 24 to houston 24 they were four nothing right wasn't it all yeah yes. they were down was, 10 yes. points to tennessee oh, they were down man. 10 points to the 49ers it's almost and think about what that does psychologically to the opposing team. Your objective yes. is to beat them. If you get a lead, you become more scared and you play differently. And they're also, I mean, this is like if you could design a circumstance for a great team inside of a video game, the Chiefs are that. Because and I even mean going into 2020, they're returning all 11 starters. They're returning, I believe, 10 of 11 on defense. They filled one of their holes by drafting Clyde Edwards-Alaire in the draft. Uh, they paid their best player on offense and defense, Patrick Mahomes and Chris Jones. And they have complete continuity in coaching staff, all players, on a season in which there might not be much of a training camp and opportunity for any of these new offensive coordinators and head coaches to do anything in terms of building any type of, you know, uh, just coordinated playing with these teams. No, are they going Andy undefeated? Reed? This is what is, I'm asking you. Is Andy Reid the one who's like, yeah, we don't need no preseason. We don't need to do that. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about tra- guys. We don't need training camp either. Let's just start the season. I mean, so you start with the fantasy discussion, not around whether Patrick Mahomes is good. Yeah, he's good. He should be your quarterback. Sure. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the discussion on Clyde Edwards, Alaire to me. Because we we talked about you know the excitement for Montgomery last year, who was coming into a great running offense, and make no mistake, I mean, if you are an Andy Reid running back, sixteen years as a head coach, his top running back has been a top ten scorer twelve times in sixteen years. Yeah, I went and I looked. Damian Williams, who is it, look, he was a fantasy bust last year because of injury. Like every game that Damian Williams played in over 60% of the snaps, he was a top 16 running back at worst. Yeah, like and he, that's... He produces when he's on the field. So does that speak to a willingness to just spin up on Clyde edwards alaire that some are doing and just... Ugh. Sure, it might be it might be a tough three, four, five weeks. You know, you've got all the rhetoric about Damian Williams ready to compete, but you don't invest that, that kind of draft capital on a guy that you're not going to make your running back, right? Eventually, you're right. Eventually, you know, he, he will be the absolute dominant fantasy option on this team. It's just a matter of when and what it costs you. Um, the win, I, I believe, won't be for the first four or five weeks of the season, especially with this shortened preseason coming in. Uh, you know, the, the running back coach talking up Damian Williams. Um, I, you know, the, 
this won't be, you know, Kareem Hunt came in and was great, got the whole workload as a rookie, but that was because he wasn't supposed to. The, the presumed starter got injured. Um, if that happens, goodness. Uh, I mean, well, Clyde Damian Edwards Williams, is, now is going to be in the first round. I'm and starting to change. I'm starting to change. What, you're on, rising. You're, I'm you're, starting to soften on my thought that Damien will have much of that backfield for very long. Oh, you're so you're shifting over to Edwards a layer. I'm just I, I'm shifting towards the thought that Jason, you know what you're saying is true, but that timeline, I'm shrinking it in my head. I'm thinking maybe one or two weeks for there to be more of a, a shared backfield, and then Clyde, you know, great players separate themselves. Damian Williams has been able to, you know, third down wheel routes. He's not a traditional, you know. We saw this in the playoffs. We were looking at Damian Williams in the backfield versus Derrick Henry, and you said, "Oh, this is just they, they don't play the same position." Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're very different. But uh, when you're speaking to the cost, like if it's if it's one to two weeks, Andy, like you f are starting to uh, yeah. project, then Clyde edwards alert to me, 100% worth the draft pick. What's wild is if, if you start thinking about it, if it takes five to six weeks, but you're confident in about five to six games, edwards alert will be the primary running back. I still think that he's probably worth that draft pick. I mean, you have to figure out your team in the meanwhile, how to get off to a hot start, how to uh, survive without your second round pick doing really anything for you at the beginning of the season. But like I said, for, well, for Damian, the, when, when there is a running back on the field a lot for Kansas City, they're a top 10 running back. So I've got a perfect question for you to put okay. this on the table. It, because you're, what you're saying is the ceiling's so high for Clyde exactly. if when he's the guy exactly. that the cost is worth it. So pretend right now Christian McCaffrey or, or Saquon Barkley or Ezekiel Elliott suspended six games. Where do they go in your fantasy draft? With wow. the output that they would bring you. Right. If Christian McCaffrey wasn't hurt well, then we, I mean, we and you get that. him in week seven, you saw well, that they, with... with Z, didn't Zeke had a couple years ago, he started... Yeah, but it wasn't this, in the draft. Oh, no, he actually it was in the middle of the season. Yeah, okay. It was okay. in the middle of the season when the suspension came down, so you, you weren't sure. But we did have the conversations that, that mirrored this. Where would they go? Right. Um, and, and I think that that depends on you know who else is on the board in different years to say they'd go at the back of the first or the beginning of the second. Uh, to me, you know, I, I still do think Damon Williams is involved. I don't like getting off to a slow start, but I, I will grant you that Clyde Edwards-Alaire will be a great second half of the year player, but I want to get off to a hot start in all my redraft and keeper leagues. So at a, if it was a third round pick, then I'd be fine going running back, running back, running back, and knowing that I've got two guys ahead of Clyde Edwards-Alaire. If he's in the third round, I'm fine. But the second, that means that well, I only have you one go? other starting running back, and then I'm plugging a hole with a... Sony Michelle later or a, you know Jordan Howard I, I don't want to do that well what about still doing that going running back running back running back but instead but you're grabbing Edwards Alaire in the second round and then in the third round then you're drafting Le'Veon Bell Chris Carson uh Connor sure I, you don't have to go down to David Montgomery just in things that could happen inside of your draft are you okay starting that with the potential that on the second half of the season, you have a top 10, possibly even better fantasy running back through that time span. I think if I, if just personally, if I were to grab Edwards Alaire, I'll end up with three running backs in the first three rounds. The interesting thing, though, about the discussion is Clyde Edwards Alaire is not suspended. So there is a right. percentage chance that the timeline is faster. And there is a percentage chance he's a valuable player because this offense is the best in football. They lose with 36 points. There's a chance that he's startable. He's flexible before he's even the guy. Sure. So that's why I've changed my thought process a little bit. Uh, Where do you guys have him? I have him on the season at running back 15. So I still have him finishing. Yeah, you've got him higher than I do right now. But I, I'm warming to... Uh, he's at 15 for me. Yeah. Okay. He's at 18 right now on my board, which is Chris Carson, Lev Bell, David Johnson range. Uh, because of what we've talked about in the past, but I'm just starting to see a pathway where because that that is such a high ceiling. Exactly. And if you can maneuver your way through three, four, five weeks of the season without him as your number one player, 
if he becomes that, he's a top 10 running back the in thing the third is, round. Is I, I want to make the argument against Edwards Alaire on talent. I wasn't a huge fan of him and talk about what well, we haven't seen him. There is a chance that he doesn't succeed as well. But I just I don't actually believe that with Pat Mahomes and Andy <laughs> Reid. Like the the schematically, he's going to get the ball open in whoever the running back is. I don't care. Damian Williams, I've said forever, is not a good running back, but he's great at fantasy if he's got the ball in that system. So anybody will be. Dude, Meaning my, that why you got to is... do my man dirty like that? No. This should have been the Super Bowl MVP. At the wide receiving uh, position, Tyreek Hill, McCall Hardman, Sammy Watkins. Um, <laughs> being pointed out to me that Sammy is still just 27 <laughs> years old, <laughs> same age as Devontae Parker's breakout season. Uh, I, that don't that does not matter to me. If you heard Sammy Watkins talk about this season, he basically comes out and says he's not going to be that productive. <laughs> he basically said, you know, I'd rather be a guy that that's under a thousand yards on a Super Bowl team than go somewhere and try to shoot for a thousand yards. So his expectations have been qualmed by, I don't know, his career, maybe. Fair, but he did average 96 yards a game in the playoffs. Like oh, the, the, yeah. The toughest of the competition. He was almost 100 a game. I think my Sony Michelle playoff argument that went into last year has <laughs> cooled me on playoff <laughs> arguments a little bit. But no, I mean, Sammy is still, he's being drafted as a wide receiver 58. I mean, is that appropriate? That doesn't feel appropriate to me for I, Patrick Mahomes' is. Number two, number two weapon. Yeah, yeah, no, I would. I'm fine drafting him. I mean, there. this is the a other. wide receiver 54. This is not no wide receiver 58. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. <laughs> I think that he is. He, his the cost of drafting him is just it's too low for what he could become. Tyreek Hill is also a very difficult uh, evaluation for me because you have the first five weeks for so he got injured right away, but then right when he comes back. For five games, he's the wide receiver two in points per game over that stretch. Hurts his hamstring in week 11, and then his average finish becomes wide receiver 35. And I've kind of made the argument about you can see a correlation between the defense getting better and Tyreek Hill's production going down, but but then you also have to factor it was a hamstring injury, and a hamstring injury for Tyreek Hill is going to be pretty devastating for him. Jay, where... How are you on on Tyreek Hill right now? Yeah, the the defense argument of the Kansas City Chiefs having a much better defense the second half of the year, requiring them to score less, uh, it holds a little a little bit of water. But I, you know, to me personally, I don't have a qualm at all about taking Tyreek Hill um, in that top group. Uh, you know, when I when I look at the best wide receivers out there, you know, Michael Thomas is in that first tier and then it's pretty much Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams and Julio to me. Like I I don't I, I'll put them in a blender. I'll I'll take one out or a you know That sounds painful. If not they're a in blender, a blender, you're not getting a, one out. That's oh, the whole I'm getting point all of a three blender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is how I get my veggies. Jason blends things together and then takes one object out somehow. <laughs> That's right. Um yeah, but I'm I'm just saying like I I I don't have fears that Tyreek because here's the truth. The truth is he is one of the fastest, if not the most practically fast player in the NFL with the best quarterback. Yeah. One of the best. I mean, he, he's proven it. his entire him. career. He's, he's been great. So I'm not, I'm not uh, reading into his hamstring induced poor performance last, last half of last year. Dynasty question on Travis Kelsey. He's the, he's the tight end one. How many more seasons do you think he has at that range? At least, at least two for me, okay. probably three. Which means that he still would be my number one L tight end. Last year, ninety-seven for twelve, twenty-nine and five. So that's, there's touchdown upside still yeah, with Travis imagine Kelsey. If it was ten. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the Denver Broncos. Moving on. Uh, if I've learned anything over the last three months, Broncos fans are are real and they are they are intense. They believe they're they're just a passionate people. They believe in an undefeated season on the way. Drew Locke's the future. Well, wasn't they Drew were, Locke like four and one? Uh, he was that's true. He was four and one. The Denver Broncos were seven and nine last year. It was a bad offense. Thirty second in football. That's bad. And passing touchdowns. Um, 
they did not have a lot of weapons, which is probably one of the kind of arguments for why Drew Locke can have more success on the field. Yes, they were four and one. Yes, over his five starts, he posted six and a half yards per pass attempt and just an 89 rating. Um, Drew Locke was not good for fantasy, for himself or his, for the Cortland Suttons of I, the world. I believe there was one good game in there. Yeah, one out of oh, five is bad for fantasy. Yeah, QB, <laughs> yes, here's yes. his finishes. QB 22, <laughs> QB 8, QB 31, QB yeah, 20, QB 21, and, and over Submarine Cortland Sutton. Over that time span, though, like three of those five matchups were top eight matchups for fantasy quarterbacks. So him not coming through in the majority of you're those talking about fantasy. easy, easy schedule. Yes. Yeah. 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 He and then, yeah, he is the centerpiece of everything that you put together going forward. You look at this team; they added weapons. They added, uh, you know, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, uh, Melvin Gordon. Uh, Glasgow at center. I mean, they have really done everything in their power to put Great together a really good offense to match what I think is a is a pretty good defense. And none of it matters if Drew Locke isn't good. The whole question is: Is Drew Locke actually really good? Can he take that step forward and make those other weapons work or not? He won games, but it was an easy schedule. He wasn't that good. He was bad at throwing the ball accurately you know, past 10 yards. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not confident in Drew Locke as, you know, a, a, as a top. I'm not, I am not either quarterback. And you have to make that decision when you invest in all of the weapons around him. Cortland Sutton fared best with Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco was far more accurate uh, than Drew Locke was. Locke, at least Locke finished at 64%. That's still not bad like that that's it's just a matter of where you look at where they're throwing zero to five right. yards zero to ten yards yeah and uh, i'll say this for sutton yes the the production was down but at least he was still the number one target he was getting at eight targets a game with drew Locke. his his target share in those games was actually slightly up compared to the rest of the season so the the opportunity for sutton is still was still there i should say it, and you got to project you got to project a move, uh, a move of luck to being better, or luck to being better than because, you know, those target numbers combined with the fact he ended up at wide receiver thirty eight or lower in four of the five games with luck, right, shows you, I guess, what concerns exist for any situation with a quarterback trans uh, transition. I mean, last year Sutton was wide receiver thirteen with Joe Flacco on the season, so any of these teams facing, you know, just to make it more global. Any of the teams facing quarterback transitions, this shows you that you can make a transition, still win football games. I mean, the the winning argument's tough because we're in the fantasy game, and right. the Pittsburgh Steelers won games last year. Don't care, and they did not. Those <laughs> that did not make you know, uh, Duck Hodges the future of the team. And I don't want to you know when Drew Lock is throwing to Deshaun Hamilton. And he's, you know, he does not have all these weapons that they brought in. That's going to be a problem too. And he, he's got a whole nother year to mature. This is not to, you know, don't draft a Bronco. I'm just kind of concerned. And my projection for Locke has him struggling. So um, wide receiver 19 is where Sutton is being drafted. That's yeah. fourth round. I don't uh, think I want to do that. I don't want to do that. He, he certainly <laughs> has the ability. And with the question mark and Locke could could crush that. He could take a step forward and Locke takes a step forward and you end up having a good draft pick there. But, you know, I, I think are, are all three of us kind of... I'm slightly lower than ADP on Sutton. I'm at 23. So. Are all three of us, uh, I know Andy and I, based on what we just said, are not believers in Locke as a true franchise quarterback. Where do you stand, Mike? I, I don't think I feel strongly one way or the other. It was... Okay. So you're it's in the middle. five games right at the end of the season. It, yep. It's I'm I'm not taking a bunch from that sample size, so I I, I just don't know. Yeah. He's surrounded. So if like what we're what we're saying of if Drew Lock fails, it's Drew Lock's fault. The last it's not month, the people around him. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. The last month with Drew Lock, Cortland Sutton was the wide receiver forty eight. That's, oh, that's lower. Not, low. That's, that's low. That's below wide receiver 19 where he's being drafted 
Yeah, and it you know we've seen players go one direction or the other in that sophomore year. That next opportunity, we've seen Goff make huge improvements. That one of the big changes for this team is making the decision to bring in Pat Schumer uh, at, yes. at offensive coordinator, which I think is a good move. He was the head coach uh, in New York for a couple of years. I think he's a good addition. I like him. I, I thought he got a rough situation in New York, and he might be just one of those guys that's better as a coordinator, a.k.a. Norv Turner type of play, uh, of coach. But you give Pat Shermer some weapons. You give Drew Locke an offseason. I love – I mean, I, I literally – I look at what Denver has done in the offseason. I go, this is just a home run across – I love – I love the moves they've made, and it's 100% now on lock to to, to step it up. Shermer's going to be good for him, though. He's he's going to scheme things, pass when he should pass. Uh, and he'll be wiser. good for Melvin Gordon, yes. too. Like, Schumer, Schumer running games historically are are great. So, that to me, that is, that's the glimmer of hope for me for Melvin Gordon because I'm not nearly as bullish uh, on his uh, – fantasy prospects as you guys like i i see it i see the path the opportunity should be there since he was given the money it's a little i, I thought the move was interesting when you have philip Lindsay who's having success for your team that you go out and you dethrone him as the starter with melvin gordon uh, but but there I, I i at least see the path i don't really want to draft melvin gordon who's though. the goal who's the goal line back in denver melvin, melvin gordon. gordon who's the passing down back in denver Melvin Gordon. That's that's Without what a doubt. A little bit. That's the reason I I least like him to be. Like, do you like? Let me ask you this, Mike. Melvin Gordon or David Montgomery? Oh, that that's a great question. A, that's a very good question, and they are in fact back to back in my rankings. I have David Montgomery one spot ahead of him. Yeah, I would. I'd, I would rather have Melvin Gordon. I think he's he's actually proven it in the NFL. While maybe he isn't uh, the efficiency, you know, leader. Over his career, he's gotten the job done. He's great around the goal line. He's great as a pass catcher, um, and he's two revenge games this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, quick hits right here before he closes his team out. <laughs> the Chargers also will want their revenge. Yeah, and they've got the defense to give it. Um, yes, Philip Lindsay, any value? Oh man, no, only as a backup. Uh, uh, yeah, N not really. No, he fantastic breakout opportunity. He is on that list. Buy or sell. <laughs> he, he's sell. on the he's on the list of uh, that we bring up for Chris Herndon of since 2000. You have a very small handful of tight ends who actually hit 500 yards in their rookie year. He did it, but no, I'm not. I'm not in on Fant. Not this year. Okay, Las Vegas Raiders. Wait, the one name we didn't talk about. I just want to mention because with all this talk about uh, all the weapons. Jerry Judy is exceptional. He is you love. You love Jerry Judy. I do love Jerry Judy. I think he's one of those guys that, you know, could make Locke better than Locke. Um, and so he's one. He's he's one of those late dart throws that I would take my shot on that if Locke turns out OK, because I, I, I just when I watch this tape, he's the only guy that I've ever been able to look at and say, oh, he's. He's kind of got Odell Beckham in him, which, you know, was a, just a crazy special talent. All right, let's talk about the Raiders. Uh, I don't know where to go exactly. <laughs> this is a different, confusing team because you can make, I think, simultaneous arguments that this team would love to move on from Derek Carr at a moment's notice. You can also make statistical arguments that Derek Carr had the best season of his career last year. Um, career highs and completion rate. The team was pretty decent, ninth in passing yards per game. Um, they were competing on a regular basis in John Gruden's system. They also didn't target the wide receiver at all. They didn't have wide receivers to target, which was part of the problem. But they were like 30th in the NFL in terms of targeting the wide receiver position. You had Darren Waller go crazy. Mm. Um, Hunter Ren Renfro was hurt for a lot of the year. Tyrell Williams was hurt. This offseason, they draft Henry Ruggs with the first wide receiver pick of the entire NFL draft. Give me kind of the high-level drill down of how you view this offense. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. It I still think that the offense runs through Darren Waller. Uh, we have 28 times that a tight end has had 1,100 or more yards. And 
like this is if you want to talk to the regression of Darren Waller, maybe his targets come down. But last year, eleven hundred yards. We've only seen that twenty eight times, and of that group, Waller is tied for the lowest touchdowns of that group because I what do you have three three touchdowns and seventy five percent of those players those tight ends had at least seven touchdowns so you have you have touchdown positive regression that is coming for Darren Waller even if you think that the volume is going to come down I still think he is the uh the key cog uh of the offense that that will make things go he's the short route guy I know you know uh uh the slot machine is there uh <laughs> holding things down but like Waller is the one who opens it up for the Henry Ruggs draft pick to me. It does Henry Ruggs have fantasy value this year? Uh, I think so. I th- I think he will. But the dude, like, if if you want to look at Tyreek Hill and go, the guy is just so fast. Like, you guys, you have to say that about Henry Ruggs. That dude is just so fast that I think he will have value. Yeah, he he certainly has a skill set that works in the NFL. I just worry that it's not going to be a high volume uh, usage with what I saw in college, the way he was, you know, what the wide receiver two or three for his own team, Um, you know, the way that you project the Raiders offense forward, like you said, things kind of running through the tight end, which is what Gruden said. And then that's what they did last year. Um, I think in best ball. He's got great potential because if you're telling me name a couple players who could have three 70 yard touchdowns this year, Ruggs is is on the short list. But making the start in your redraft or keeper league, I don't want to trust that this season. Um, Josh Jacobs is the is the piece I want more than anything. Sure. Uh, He was not good. He was great. (laughs) And I don't think people realize that because he missed a couple games. He wasn't involved in the passing. You know, on a per game basis, he was third in rushing yards per game up there with Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb, who were outstanding. That's how good Josh Jacobs was in his rookie year. Um, It's just a matter of whether they can get him more involved in the passing game. And we've talked about this recently. He's going to have more work than, he. you know, he's going to have more than 20 receptions, which is what Mm -hmm. he had last year. I think Jacobs, I I, I was polled the other day um, by another uh, fantasy entity about players that could make their debut in that top five a group of running backs most likely to do it jacobs was my answer for basically every breakout category missing a few games provides a adp opportunity for fantasy players to get josh jacobs at a better value than they could it's very similar to me than to, to the excitement that i had for dalvin cook coming into last year he was the breakout you know guy that just stood out to me as somebody that Everything's laid out for him to have success. This team, you know, he was an investment by John Gruden. I, I'm on board completely. I think he has – not everybody has the chance to be a top three running back. He has a chance to me. He's got the yeah. shot. Hmm. Jo- Josh yeah. Jacobs, to me, is one of my favorite second-round picks. If I'm in the second round and I leave with Josh Jacobs anywhere in it, I mean, I was I was the second pick in the second round in an industry mock, and I took Jacobs. I absolutely love his upside and the fact that he can be your second running back or you can have, you know, a Michael Thomas paired with someone that could be that top five guy. I I just absolutely love the potential. Uh, Jacobs is not a hard sell. Is there, are you looking at uh, Derek Carr in two quarterback situations at all with upside? If he's got, you know, improved weapons, if Josh Jacobs is involved in the passing game and you believe in what he can do with the ball in his hands, Do you have any belief in Derek Carr? Yeah, this might sound like a cop-out, but it's actually 100% true. Derek Carr is my absolute favorite target in a two-quarterback league as my third quarterback. That (laughs) That is not very nice. (laughs) But but it it kind of is because I believe Derek Carr can actually be really, really good this year, but I worry about Marcus Mariota. You know, it's like Gardner Minshew, he can suck all season. They they got nobody else to go to. If Derek Carr and the Raiders are struggling... you say that about Mike Glennon. (laughs) Exactly. If Derek Carr and the the Raiders are struggling, there will be clamoring for their $15 million backup quarterback, but I think he's good. And if they can win enough games and, and move forward offensively, 
he's one of those guys that's there in the group of the third quarterbacks being drafted in two quarterback leagues and you want a third quarterback, he's the guy I target. All right, uh, let's talk about Darren Waller before we move on from this team. Last year, big-time season, Mike says the offense is still going to go through him. Draft costs, six-round pick, tight end five. Are you comfortable? I'm okay with it, yeah. You want to know what makes me uncomfortable and it's really dumb? Is Itching that powder. <laughs> yes. Oh, super dumb. Why did they why did anybody invent <laughs> this thing? It's the worst. Um no, it's the fact that my my one of my biggest fears is the history we have over the last couple of years of these round five, six tight ends. Every time that there's the round five, round six tight end seems like the next guy after all the good guys, they always bust. Um, and so I kind of am fearful that way because you can see how it how it happens. I mean, yes. they had no wide receivers to throw the ball to. Hunter Renfro didn't get started early. Uh, then he got injured. Uh, then they add Nelson Aguilar. They add they get Tyrell Williams back. You know, from his injury, they add Henry Ruggs. They they add Brian Edwards. There is a very clear and obvious path for the team to not run through Darren Waller. Sure. Now, I, it, I still have him as my fifth tight end past those four aforementioned, you know, much clearer, higher tier tight ends. But I, I pass him in every draft that I've, I, I've been in plenty of drafts where it's like, oh, I need a tight end. Darren Waller's highest on my board. He's available here. Nope. I like other running backs and wide receivers. I will say it, it now last year is uh, kind of proof that this doesn't always happen, but frequently those middle tier tight ends the middle round guys it's you're going for the older tight end who just like they're they, they're they feel like they're on the way down but darren waller is still young and athletic enough just got the bag of i think that he's still safe all right anything else you want to talk about with the las vegas raiders shall we move on all right wrapping it up with the los angeles chargers last year five and eleven Season did not go the way that they thought it would go. Phillip Rivers is now gone. Anthony Lynn, at head coach, still around. I like Anthony Lynn. They've had some yeah, I think he's a good coach. tough luck over the last couple of years. No more Rivers, no more Gordon, though. Those were kind of the, the fantasy foundation of that team for the past five years. I know, years. and then they like upgraded at the running back position. Addition uh, by subtraction, with, am I right? You're talking about Awesome Eckler? That's who I'm talking about. Yeah, so uh, Austin Eckler is the starting running back of this team, a team that now has a new quarterback that may or may not be Tyrod Taylor for a number of weeks, that may be Justin Herbert, who was drafted with the sixth overall pick. They add Joshua Kelly in the fourth round, a running back that will be complementary to Austin Eckler and to Justin Jackson. And I think this is one of those teams with a million question marks because much like Denver, where the offense is going to go as far as Drew Locke can take them, you know, you need to have some level of confidence in who's throwing the football to make bets on players like Keenan Allen or Austin Eckler and the receiving totals he had from last season, um, or even Mike Williams, you know, somebody whose name isn't brought up at all. Last year, his name mm -hmm. brought up all the time because he's coming off a double digit touchdown season and Phillip Rivers is there. I, I don't know if we said Mike Williams' name on the show. It's tough to want the number two wide receiver when you don't want the number one wide receiver. And that's not that's to say a very fair point. That's not to say that I wouldn't want Keenan Allen on my team. He's a phenomenal receiver, but we've brought up the point before when great receivers have a, a lull in their quarterbacks. You know, we, we saw it with Fitz. All of a sudden, they don't have a great fantasy output. You know, you're talking about a wide receiver, too. And the passing volume is the number one thing that scares the heck out of me with the Chargers. I project for them to be a low passing volume team. I have from the get go. I think Tyrod Taylor is going to start at least half the season. Um, and, you know, keep in mind, Anthony Lynn, he's the head coach. He was the offensive coordinator for the Buffalo Bills with Tyrod Taylor. They've ran together. They've they've put, installed an NFL system with those two together. And it was one, back to back years of bottom of the barrel passing offense and they were fine. They had a good defense. They weren't a they weren't a atrocious team. It worked for the NFL, but it didn't work for fantasy. So that you love is, Austin Eckler then? That's my problem with Austin Eckler is because his 
value comes much more as a receiver than as a runner. He was he was fine as a runner, but if they end up having uh, you know Justin Jackson helping carry that workload, Joshua Kelly, uh, the rookie they brought in, and all of a sudden Austin Eckler's passing receiving work goes way down, that's that's a scary proposition. Let's not rediscuss Austin Eckler. We talked about but it. I have, but I have some good points. Free agent That's frenzy and early breakouts and busts. Oh, and it's too bad. I looked something else different up because I wanted to bring this, this up new. This is new. This is new. This is new. new. This is brand right. new. I'm trying, I'm I'm trying to sway Jason. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Got my listening well, cap on. All right. First off, let's, let's talk about Austin Eckler on the ground. Those first four games when Melvin Gordon wasn't there, he averaged 14 attempts a game. That's over. That's way yep. over 200 carries. Not new. For the Go season. on. No, I'm just saying, yep. and I want to combo with that with why do we like, you know, like Mark Ingram so much? Why do we talk so much about running backs who have very mobile rushing quarterbacks and you're not giving the same benefit of the doubt to Austin Eckler? Taylor is very mobile. He will open things up for Austin Eckler on the ground. I didn't, I haven't heard us make that exact same argument for him. And then I wanted to talk about the passing volume. Uh, the last year with Taylor in Buffalo, McCoy had 77 targets in in that season. He ran 326 routes that year. Last year, Austin Eckler ran 362 routes, and he was competing for time with Melvin Gordon. He wasn't the number one running back on the team the whole entire season. He's going to run a bunch of routes. Like I don't. Yes, the targets are going to come down, but I think that you're the gloom and doom of well, his his receiving work is just cut in half. At the at the best case scenario, I think that's not. I don't think that's je- the right way to look. I think at it's what intellectually the team. I think it's intellectually dishonest to compare Austin Eckler with the full workhorse Shady, who was the clear bell cow for their team. If you think Austin Eckler is going to inherit a bell cow role here, and Justin Jackson and Joshua Kelly aren't going to be involved, then it is absolutely a fair comp. He could dominate the same way that Shady did. I think he has the talent to do it. I do not think for one second he's going to be a bell cow back that's out there for you know soaking up the the rushing, the receiving, just everything that the offense is doing. Uh, let, let me throw one more thing in as just a reminder. The reason I like Austin Eckler is because even if you're right about some of it coming down, none of us are making the argument he will finish as the running back six. The running back six is where Austin Eckler finished last season when he did have Melvin Gordon there for 12 of 16 games. So it's easier for me to rationalize a position as a fringe running back one when it means a reduction in his fantasy output uh, as part of that. So that's why I'm kind of more on board. Um, It will be different, Mm -hmm. but they will still have to run an offense. And Austin Eckler was paid this offseason. Austin Eckler is fundamental to the offense. Whether that translates to RB10, RB20, will be contingent on how much passing work he gets, most likely. Yeah, I have him, I have him at the RB17, which means I think he's going to be a very valuable, useful fantasy player. You say RB70? 17. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, just kidding. So, just you know, but, but where he's being drafted, he won't ever end up on my team because he's being, he's being drafted, you know, as a, as a back end one early. Uh, early too, and and to speak to Mike's point about the Baltimore Ravens, they ran 596 times last year. You look at the well, Arizona I'm not Cardinals. Talking about and the pace I was of talking play. about we well, like running backs who are playing with running. We like running. We like running backs who play with running quarterbacks yes. because it just naturally helps them. Yes, it helps their efficiency, but the yes. efficiency still has to look at volume too. Uh, they start the season against Cincinnati, which means that if you did take a gamble on a you know, a first week start at quarterback with a Tyrod Taylor. It might not be the end of the world, two quarterback league. Um, look yeah, at those like week one or two matchups. I mean, opportunity is there. Other players on this team worth discussing, you know, well, I'm I lower to, on Keenan Allen, that's for sure. Go ahead, Mike. I say Keenan Allen, it, Keenan Allen is so hard because uh, I think that the transition at quarterback affects him more than Austin Eckler. And it betting against Keenan Allen is it hurts inside. Like it hurts my heart because Keenan Allen is great. Keenan Allen is a true number one wide receiver. If you look at the reception perception metrics he puts up in every single year, he is an elite route runner. The way that you talk about like Stephon Diggs, 
Keenan Allen gets open all the time. So let, uh, but I agree that there will be some volume differences with Taylor running things, and so it it has it has concerns for for, for what he can do. He's already you know an up and down fantasy wide receiver, but when he is on a hot streak, like. He, he he wins you multiple weeks in a row by himself. I feel like this is the perfect show to illustrate the fact that quarterback transition makes a humongous difference with what Drew Locke and Cortland. We all believe Cortland Sutton is a monster. Mm-hmm. I believe yeah. I believe Larry Fitzgerald is pretty good. He had three different years with quarterback transitions where he disappeared during his prime from from a fantasy perspective. You know, he went from monstrous seasons to you know six hundred something yards, eight hundred yards. I mean, you have to make a bet and. There are times when players like DeAndre Hopkins has have waded through multiple crappy sure. quarterbacks and been fine, but then there's been situations like Larry Fitzgerald when they haven't, and um, because of the volume mixed into like I don't think Taylor's going to be throwing the ball as well as Philip Rivers throws the football. Uh, that cause and because they think a more conservative offensive mindset is going to hurt him a little bit. I'm I'm just out on Allen compared to draft price, but everybody has to make that decision because the talent is obviously tremendous. The He's wide receiver point, 22 right now. Yeah, the one the one point I wanted to make for Mike Williams is that Taylor Taylor throws the ball deep. Like the volume is down, but in in his time at Buffalo, he was always in the top half when it came to percentage of throws that are going deep. And in his first year, he threw it at a deep rate of 18.2%. That's, I mean, he had Sammy Watkins there, uh, but I at least wanted to bring up Mike Williams, who, according to Reception Perception, he has the ninth best success rate on nine routes. I mean, you got a, a wide receiver who's good at running a nine, who is elite at contested catch. You pair that with a quarterback who does like to throw the ball deep. I think Mike Williams might be uh, that's undervalued. Worth, that's worth He's 25 years old, 6'4", 220. First round NFL draft pick. He's He's great. I don't think anybody I would want Mike Williams on my NFL team that's for sure um for fantasy I think maybe you bring up a good point here Mike when it comes for uh when you're at those later guys Mike Williams fits the bill for a best ball because if you're going to get those big deep you know if his passing volume comes down but he's going to have some long bomb touchdowns uh that's that's good when you don't have to make the decision and he doesn't. He's never dependent on volume. I mean, forty nine catches last year for a thousand yards. That's twenty yeah. per catch. Do it on three or four plays a game. My you know. goodness, what? Hold on. Is that really the line that he put up? Yeah, twenty yards of reception. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Brooks, Holy do you know if that's crap. number one in football? I think it's got to yeah, be. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, really? number AJ, one on the season. What's AJ Brown? Not twenty point four, but oh, I, will, I thought he I was in the twenties. I mean, it's uh, twenty point two. What an idiot! Twenty point two. Jason, you oh, what a loser! I was such a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. We'll be back with a Saturday episode. Remember, three shows a week and four if you're a member at jointhefoot.com. Mailbag question coming tomorrow. Talk to you then. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.